Hello, everyone. Welcome to a uh, Warwick Zoom Garden Plot. Uh, today, is September thirteenth, which is season two, episode fourteen. And uh, welcome again. You know, we're getting near the end of the season, but I think people are probably still producing a lot of tomatoes, etc., and uh, peppers and all that. So, yeah, it's you know probably a few more weeks of a lot of production, and then wrapping it up, which maybe next session we'll go into, you know, more of what you do at the end of the season. But today we uh, have a lot of wrapping up to do. Uh, welcome. So right, on the agenda, oh, why isn't I going to the next Oh, there we go. Sorry. Tonight's agenda. Uh, we'll have Leslie, hopefully. I'm here. Oh, you're here? Oh, good. Sorry. I guess. <laughs> with your good peppers and uh, Sarah from the Warwick Community Garden and a lot of question and answers and a few announcements. Um, Michael, unfortunately, we love having him, but he has to run pretty quickly. So, but he does have a, before we get to anything, he does have a groundhog uh, update or a history. You want to give your uh, update first? Okay. Um, Chair, do you want to stop sharing the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we decided to name our groundhog Tommy, or this particular one. I'm not sure. I think there are other neighbor, other groundhogs who are around our yard, but outside the deer fence. And this one particular one who we've named Tommy has come inside. Uh, the Chinese word for groundhog is Tubasu, which is a little bit like Thomas, but I'm not sure if it's a male or female. So Tommy is sort of gender neutral. So, uh, so um, as we know, from, from a previous exciting episode of the Zoom Garden Plot, this groundhog had started a burrow under a pallet in my woodshed. And the woodshed is inside uh, the deer fence. And uh, so uh, I moved the wood off the pallet. I moved the pallet. And when Tommy was out of the, the burrow, I uh, filled it in and covered it with chicken wire. Uh, and uh, I saw him studying my work here. So this was his first, first steps in the negotiation was to just move in under the pallets. My first move was to fill in his burrow and cover it with chicken wire. Then in the next round of negotiations, uh, he somehow showed up again inside the fence. Now, I wasn't sure how he was getting in or getting out. I really wasn't sure of this. And um, he showed up in the yard, like on the other side from the, from the woodshed. And when I saw him, I sort of ran after him. And he ran along the fence to one corner, turned around along the back edge of the fence. He ran all of that way. It's not like he, he didn't run to a, a, a hole where he can go in and out. My hope was he was going to show me where he was going in and out. He didn't show me. Uh, he and he didn't run. He didn't climb over the fence or anything, and and he went past a past a place where I've seen a cat, like there's there's an angular board, and I've seen a cat like walk up that and jump out. They can so, go pretty far underground. The, the, well, they can, but I, you know I'm 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 watching closely for anything yeah. that comes up inside the deer fence. I can make sure he's not in there fill it in and cover with, with chicken wire and I'm sure it's going to stop but I, I've only seen him burrow one place inside so this particular day he ran up and he was waiting by he hid behind this little fig tree teeny fig tree in the corner and he wasn't really hiding I could see him there and he looked at me and he started like he was going to try to jump through the fence or bite through the fence and that wasn't going to work and then he started doing this thing with all four limbs like he was trying to dig himself out right there it was fascinating to see him doing this digging. And also I was a little bit concerned because it was right by the roots of this little fig plant. Uh, so he just sat there and watched me. Finally, uh, I went and got a hose. Mm. And uh, this, this hose, unfortunately, didn't have a good nozzle on it. It had like a, a wand. It was a wand. Okay. So still I could like give him a shower. And from that, he started running out of there and, and he ran to a couple other places and tried to burrow into this one other. Finally, we got him to come out, but he 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 got away from us and, and I'd opened the big a big gate on the deer fence, hoping 
he's going to, we're going to try to get him in that direction and get him outside the deer fence, close the door, and then hopefully keep him out. Well, he disappeared. He ran under some much bigger fig trees, and then we just didn't see him after that because there's just too many places for him to hide inside. I haven't seen him doing much work inside. Uh, before he was notably um, eating the uh, sweet potato greens and tomatoes. And I want to say, Tommy was not like those squirrels. Uh, and you notice I did not throw in a nasty adjective before I said squirrels, who will take a bite out of a tomato and sort of discard it. Yes. No, he would sit and eat from the bottom and eat like 80 or 90% of the tomato. And so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was how his groundhog style of eating a tomato. Uh, and um, I recently saw one like that, but I don't know if that was there from you know, before or not. So basically I haven't seen any traces of him inside the deer fence. I'm thinking my negotiations are working. I'm making it clear he's welcome outside the deer fence. He's just not welcome inside the deer fence. So this is the current rounds of negotiations between me and Tommy. And I, I thank you all for, for sharing the story with me tonight. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing your updates. Yes. Because I have um, groundhogs, a family that live under the shed. And I actually, about six years ago, had someone come and they put in 12 inches of wire around down at the bottom of the shed, but it seems they left a small space under the ramp. And so they're back under there again. And um, what I found though, when they come out, they've made a burrow from the shed to the back fence. And that's about 30 yards. And then they've gone under the back fence and they go into the neighbor's yard. And then at night they come back. They go under the fence in the back and then they come under that underground all the way to the, um, to the shed again. And I had to have someone put um, wire all around the house because I realized that they were burrowing under the house. And so they're persistent. I've done everything. I think I've told you, I had a man come with this horrid trap you know, to get them, which I had to send home because it was just medieval. But I'm hoping you have success and can share with me your secret because I've been trying to get rid of those guys for 16 years. They do not want to go. I think we need Bill Murray. And, uh... Yes. <laughs> so so I've, um, I have a tool shed that's outside the deer fence and I cannot count the number of groundhog burrows that are under that tool shed oh, and, so I'm happy, and I'm happy for them to be there they're fine yeah. for years we have lived peaceably without them coming inside the deer fence and mucking about um it's and and there's another thing many parts of our yard um there's like this much soil and then it becomes rock mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's not ideal for groundhog burrows uh, you know, where they are is under the tool shed, that's different. And the place under the wood shed, that was different. Um, but um, um, uh, the, the, the big deal is, you know, I, I have a defined area for my deer fence. Uh, I understand that a burrow could go from outside to inside. When they put in the deer fence, the underneath the ground, they went down a foot and out six inches with a, a a, a tight uh, wiring, a, uh, it's, it's not the two by four holes. It's, you know, like a, a, a very tight wiring uh, mm -hmm. a mesh. Um, I, I know that they could, if they wanted to, they could go below that and in uh, as long as they did it in a space where it wasn't too rocky. Right. And there's, there are places like that. However, you know, I, I've got to be able to see them some point coming in and then I'm going to stop them as quickly as I can. Just, just negotiate with them. That's my, that's my point. Well, the thing you mentioned about the way they eat, the, very, the one and only thing I appreciate about them is they don't like the deer and the other animals nibble so you don't want to touch the fruit and then leave it alone. I think I told you one day on my deck, I originally had pots of tomatoes on my deck, like these 26-inch um, pots. And I was going to go out on the deck one day and there was a groundhog sitting in the pot with his paws like this, eating a tomato. 
and it was like the whole tomato. So at least they don't ruin something for you, but then again, they'll eat everything. But as soon as I touched the deck door, you went running. Michael, Michael yes, sir. You, have, you have some shrubs and berry bushes and fruit trees inside your deer fence, right? Yes. Have you looked under anything that's shrubby? Because they could have put a burrow, hidden it underneath, you know, a, a shrub. Okay. Um, I, I I have to check those places. I will okay. I will be diligent about checking them again. So it's one possibility. They are so sneaky. You know how I feel about them. <laughs> have you been able to get rid of yours? Yes. How? The trap that you didn't like. Oh. And then the fence was totally a crew. This is a community garden. And then they they dug three tunnels in from like 30 feet away. We persuaded wow. them with filling in. We persuaded them with those, those uh, rocket things. We did a lot of persuading and they were not persuaded. So they had to leave. And then we brought in the man who does the trapping passed away, unfortunately. But uh, then we had our whole crew of people come in and we reinforced all around the bottom of our garden again because some of our defenses had rotted out. Oh, okay. So yeah, we did a reinforcement. Traps. Even mm -hmm. thinking about it, I feel like crying. I can't do that. <laughs> once, they mowed, once they mowed down, you know, 16 by eight foot plots of food. Yeah. And we, I mean, we spent several months persuading them to leave and, yeah. you know, non-death threatening ways so they didn't get the hint <laughs> well it, it, going with the flow i see uh mark put in the chat he has some he might have some skunk issues does anyone have a skunk as well as groundhog uh only one i, well, um, I have a lot of skunks in my neighborhood i, I find them not they're pretty easy to get they, they don't seem to be too uh they seem to just burrow down and if like I put a little small fence, they, they didn't seem to get past it. I mean, that's at least my experience, Mark. Where do they know. live? Because I have a skunk. Um, I, I have a skunk I see in the backyard when I walk the dog late at night, and he's been tearing up my lawn. And then tonight I, I have a home garden. It's probably 25 by 25 or so. And I, I, I don't grow vegetables or anything there. I don't grow any, any um, it's mostly uh, ornamentals and, and, and herbs and mints and stuff. So I have a lot of deer issues. But when I was watering it tonight, I got this really bad, couple bad real real bad whiffs it's a skunk and doing it so there's piles of stuff and i'm just wondering if one of them made a nest in it and i just don't want to come across him or her in the wrong way and get sprayed yeah, you know scared. um yeah because because then i won't be allowed in the house for a couple months so <laughs> yeah no i'm very, so I'm I, just, very I just don't want to run into it i, I I'm, yeah. I'm just afraid of running into it well they're um, nocturnal if, yes. they're out during the, if they're out during the day, you need to call. I mean, actually, there was, I live in the village of Warwick. We have skunks all over. I had one in my crawl space one time, and I had a guy come and trap it. But I just, I'm careful about being in the yard at night. I don't let the dog out in the yard at night. Yeah. And if you see one during the daytime, call the police because it's it probably has rabies. Pro yeah, but I'm just wondering if it's like, this was kind of uh, just before I came in, into the meeting, but I'm just wondering if, if I, if, even if it's in the daytime and they're in their burrow and I disturb them, they're going to probably spray me, right? I would think. I don't know. They're all over the village and I yeah. smell them. They used to walk by my house and they, I never had any problems with them during the day. And I think I'm losing my mind. I think I kind of like that smell. For some. Okay. Are you kidding? Me? You are losing it. <laughs> I kind of like it. Well, I, like when they're in the neighborhood. I don't know why. It's funny. A lot, of, a lot of times I like the smell of things I don't do. But I mean, yeah. Again, I wouldn't go out, if you don't go out at night too much. And I mean, you don't think again, I'll run into not, it during the they're day. Not the like, okay. They're not the most mysterious creatures. They kind of big and slot. You know, you would probably yeah. see their where their nest area is. You know, they're not that. Uh, you know, not like groundhogs or you know squirrels and stuff that they, they're groundhogs really hiding come right and get in your face so that's the thing with groundhogs i've had them attack me <laughs> they don't run away when they hear you i had this one out of my yard 
they know how I feel about them. The same as deer. We have, we have little tiffs going on. They, they make noises at me and I yell at them. Because I find as soon as they hear a sound, they go running as big and fat as they are. They're pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, I'm, I'm sorry. I need, to, I need to step away. I have something else to, to, I have to get to this evening. If, if Michelle agrees, I'm going to make her the host. Okay. See you so, next time. All right. Bye, Michael. Bye. Bye, Michael. I got it. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have a great all meeting. Right, I'll be waiting to... I'll be waiting to see the uh, the video. Good, Take care. Sure. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, God, the dog didn't bark or anything, and we got away scot free. But you know, um, <laughs> right. But, uh, no, yeah, no, so the, I'm, I'm dog, really right, careful. I have flashlights, and I, I I'm very cautious because they yeah, you don't they're want very the dog sneaky. To scare it, and then they like. Shh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just grabbed them and we ran the other way as quick <laughs> as we could. Right. That, that's probably the safest bet. <laughs> All right, let me uh, start up again. And now the first one to present. Again, if I could figure out how to do this stuff. Try to make it go to the next page. Oh, there, Leslie's garden. Any questions? So uh, Leslie, you want to talk a little bit about oh, your- I forgot uh... to send you the tomatoes. Beautiful. Oh, sorry, oh, I think I, yeah, I, just got, I just got these, these pictures. Yeah, it's just bell pepper time. I have um, red, yellow, and orange uh, bell peppers, but um, so far only the, well, actually there were two orange ones last week and I ate them before I took a picture. <laughs> and um, this week it was just the, um, this weekend it was just the red ones. So I'm still waiting for the um, more orange and I haven't seen the yellow ones yet. The fennel's coming up pretty well. And I see that I have that hidden in the back and mm -hmm. some of the um, squash. And I guess it's the last of the collards. Um, they may come up for another couple of weeks, but usually by the end of September, I don't see them anymore after Wait, a couple Sorry, of last, last of the what? The collards on um, the bottom picture, the above the <clears throat> yellow squash and- Oh, the I mean, collard, you should be able to get collards for a, a while, I would think. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, yeah, because they, they, like, they like the cool, they, they like, so I had my collards like go until like a snowstorm, they, they were yeah. they, they were going really long time. So I, did I don't you have to cover them. No, I mean, uh, I, did, I like actually in an old community garden I went. They they survived. You know, it was a mild winter. They and they survived, but uh, they're pretty hardy collards. Okay, I I'll mean, see yeah, it was it wasn't something I really needed to survive. It just it lasted right until it, right. everything froze. Because last year um, they didn't make it um, through October by the end of September and beginning of October, but. Um, Hmm, maybe I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll see about putting a cover over them this year or maybe- oh, I'm sorry, when you say they didn't make it, you mean the, the critters got them? They started chewing them? Uh, no, they just um, started coming up little very wimpy um, stalks. Oh, that, that, again, that is the, you know, the, the collards and kale, you know, actually prefer I September thought, and October usually. Yeah, yeah I thought, because I had kale and that did very well, but the collards, no. So, okay, <laughs> I won't give up on them yet and see what no. they do this year. Not by any means. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know they, they do get hit hard, you know, by the uh, by the crit, you know, the critters since they're so hardy. Like you know, I they really they lay the eggs and they get chewed up a lot, but right. otherwise they, they should last. Okay. Is and, that um is that Florence fennel like uh, finocchio that you grew? The, it tastes like anise. Yeah, it has the anise. Yeah, uh, that, that's apps that that one in that one picture is is beautiful. It's mm -hmm. so nice looking. Yeah, I it's, it's, I have one on the top, so I've got two of those same um, baskets, and I didn't get the whole thing, but they're coming up really well, and they're delicious. Yes. Really good, and I don't know what it is about bell peppers, like I didn't like single one out. There's something about watching the bell peppers grow. To me, they're just amazing. I mean, I have all sorts of other thing, things growing, but there's something about all of the bell peppers start out green and then they slowly turn to yellow or orange or red. I just, they're amazing to me. They really are. They almost look fake. They're so good. They're so perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I forgot the tomatoes. I got about two dozen um, tomatoes. I have those um, Paul Robeson tomatoes, the Russian tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
with the um, purple flesh. And those are really good when you cook them. You know, I eat them raw a little bit, but I like to cook those. Sarah told us all last year to wait. <laughs> I was and like, what's this? She's like, you didn't wait long enough. So I now I now I wait till everything is fully harvestable. And I'm still complaining to the, my fellow community garden people, wait. <laughs> wait I know, you just what? sometimes you see, you can't, you just got to pick it and then you can't oh, wait. Drives me crazy. <laughs> now, uh, how is your, com is your compost still coming along nicely? I didn't take a picture of that, but the compost, because basically all the plants in that keyhole have kind of covered it, but I fill it once a week and um, water just in that compost section and it's doing really well. And I didn't usually um, say the beginning of August, I put out um, calcium for the um, peppers and tomatoes Mm -hmm. um, so that they don't end up getting that blossom and rot. And, and I forgot this year and they're still, I haven't had any problems with them, you know? So I did sprinkle a little bit the beginning of September, but that's a month after I usually do it. And um, everything's flourishing. I'll take a picture of that composter section again for next time or two times. Yeah, no, so it's definitely working well for you. Yeah, but it's working beautifully and um, watering that it's like once a week and it never dries out and everything I'm growing in there is flourishing. So it's kind of simple. Is that all from your keyhole garden? All yeah, those, those are look, from all the keyhole. I, I think I might try that. That sounds, because they look great. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, I, I talk continually about the peppers. Friend of mine say, yes, yes, you like the peppers. We got it. <laughs> but, All right, we know, we got it. But the, the peppers are doing better in there. I mean, they've been good every year, but this year they're just exquisite. I mean, they're just so beautiful. They're perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, Mark, I don't think you, uh, like a few, when we first started, uh, Leslie was showing, she had this little very interesting compost system like in the garden. So I don't, I don't know if you ever got to see any pictures of it. I think but, I did, but I can't really quite recall exactly how it looked. But that keyhole garden, I've heard about it, and it sounds like an interesting idea. And uh, the results that Leslie had are just like look fantastic. It's really so. easy. I mean, that's the thing. And I put um, um, chicken wire dome over it because I wasn't sure if any critters would try and crawl into it. So rather than mm. waiting to see, I just got yeah. one of those chicken wire domes. So, um, you know, I have the composter, I put um, landscape fabric with a rock on top of it. And on top of that, I put the chicken wire and no one's <laughs> tried to um, touch it. And I can water it right through the chicken wire dome. It goes down through the landscape fabric and into the center. And everything in there is just doing beautifully. Now, no like, work. What, what, what do you think, what are the measurements? What would you say of that little area that how much does the compost like reach out? Um, I mean, not to give it exact, you know, 20 by 20, 10 by 10. Square. It's not that big, but it goes straight down. No, but I'm saying how big is your, like how, 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 how much do you feel the compost like extends as far as its uh, influence? I think it goes through the entire um, keyhole garden. I think once I water it, the nutrients are just pulled up by all the roots. Right. Yeah, so I think the whole garden, because I mean, even the things I have, one fennel plant right behind it, and then the other fennel plant is on the, um, the right corner. So it's the furthest away, and they're both doing really beautifully. They're doing the same. And you, and you just water through the- Yeah. Through, uh, and you, so, you know, okay, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Technique. And when it rains, you know, I'll go out and I'll touch the soil and I'll say it doesn't need anything. And it's because it's like um, three feet tall, it holds a lot of the water, it stays yes. moist. So it's consistently moist in the same way that a self-watering planter would be. You know, and it's rained so much this summer. I know, so yeah, that, yeah. I would say so. You think so? You think so? <laughs> yeah, and that's one thing I have to say too, because even though it's rained this much, because the bottom of that planter is, is open, it's like the excess just goes through. So it's not as though they're getting drowned. If I had them in another kind of pot where it's constantly watering, they can't drain it out fast enough. But um, yeah, it's it's I'm in love with it. It's really good. I think next time we see you, I want to see pictures or statues of the peppers around behind you in the uh, in your house. <laughs> I definitely, 
You're definitely a, a pepper, pepper lover. I'll tell my friends, I don't have to talk to you anymore. I have other people who appreciate them. <laughs> no, well, thank you. All right, let's, uh, wait, did I see? Uh -huh. Dad, I oh, had a, had a oh, question for Leslie real quick. Yes. Leslie, can you grow hot peppers or just the sweet ones? Just the sweet ones. I didn't do hot peppers um, this year. I may next year. I wasn't sure um, like how much I should put in that garden. And I could have put more in it than I did. But um, I put the three pepper plants, two fennel plants. I have um, Thai basil and um, the cherry, um, what is it? The uh, cherry gold. Um, honey gold? Hmm? Honey gold. Is it honey gold? Honey gold um, tomatoes. The little yeah. yellow, the little orange ones? Yeah, the ones that are really sweet that never yeah. make it back into your kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I eat them as yeah. I pick them. <laughs> and um, a couple of cucumbers, just one little cucumber plant, which was finished um, about a month ago. Is anyone still getting cucumbers? Last no. few. I had very bad luck with cucumbers. Cucumbers, like I got three or four. Last year I got a ton. I don't know. And the zucchini also had very bad luck this year. Very yeah, I, I had terrible luck in there, zucchini. Uh, I, I tried. I, I, the last three years, including this, I, I grew watermelon and, and cantaloupe. And this year I had a total failure of the watermelon and cantaloupe. I don't think I got one. I got I got one cantaloupe that was kind of mealy, and I got one watermelon that was kind of, and the rest I'm going to give to my my friend who uh, raises chickens, and uh, because they're just terrible. It was the wor worst year I ever had for them. Now I got about six melons, those little baby melons. Yeah, yeah. And one cantaloupe that was bland. Yeah, exactly, bland. Yeah, and almost I like too much water. I thought I was going to get a lot more, but I didn't have those in the keyhole. I had those in this, another kind of self-watering, so maybe they had too much water. I don't know. They started off so well, and then all of a sudden we got so much rain, and it, they just kind of fizzled out, and they were yeah. terrible. And the terrible. cucumbers, I only got about a dozen cucumbers. That's it. Out yeah. of, I had three cucumber plants. And I thought, well, what's going on? I thought, well, maybe they'll be late this year, but they may have gotten drowned out too. I had those in the um, the earth box, that other kind of um, self-watering yeah. system. I don't have enough for the, they need that real hot, that hot weather. And I think we had way too much rain too. I think yeah. the combination just not, knocked them out. You know, we're at the, like the Northern edge, I think where you can really grow watermelon and you got to have that perfect hot season. And if you don't get it, they just don't, don't mm -hmm. come. That's what I think anyway. So yeah. Yeah. it was very frustrating. I, I devoted a 30 by 20 plot to it and I got nothing out of it. So, yeah, but it, it is what it is. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And do next will be the Warwick community garden. Chad, do you maybe want to take a... Oh, yeah, you question? want to do the shimmy? And, oh, yeah, it is yeah. 8, 8 o'clock. All right. You shimmy in place while I figure out how to go to the next uh, screen. So everyone get up, shimmy around in honor of Mike. Michael Helm will shimmy in place, stretch out for a minute or so. So we all like to not sit too long. Chad, we don't pause the recording, do we, for this? We just... No, no. Running we, we, well, that's up to you, I guess. Uh, no, I'm just curious what Michael does. There we go. Warwick, maybe. You got it. There we go. This takes me about 20 years to figure it out, but I got it. You...
All righty. Is everyone all stretched out? Yep. Stretched out and ready to go. Now that Sarah has mastered her cat, her phone. Yes. Not sent me movies, but pictures. We could uh, let us hear all about your beautiful garden. So this first picture here, I had mentioned earlier in the year that our um, community garden with a fair number of us have assorted joint issues at this point in life. So there was a big call for pole beans as opposed to bush beans. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the bush beans you know, we planted early and the, we planted the pole beans on the big pea trellis. And I wanted to mention these, the pole beans are very good. And this particular one, I'm like, I like green beans, but I'm not like, you know, wild about them. This is called a Northeasterner pole bean. And it is really delicious, I have to say. It's a flat bean. You eat, you know, flat, and they're very long, eight, seven, eight inches long. Oh, wow. And they have a really, really nice flavor. They call it a Romano bean with a buttery flavor and hearty texture. So when you're thinking about your pole beans next year, I would give, you know, I would give this one a try. It's pretty yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that because there are there's some beans that are prettier, like a, what I got. I got scarlet runner beans one time, which are very pretty. But I didn't find them. In, but they didn't taste good, right? Right, they weren't t that tasty. So exactly. I guess. Exactly. I, I, I find Romano, you said? Yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you want to give the name again, Sarah? I'll put it in the chat just so people could. Uh... Yeah, it's a, it's a Northeasterner pole bean. I, I bought this particular one from High Mowing Seeds. But if you just look up Romano, R-O-M-A-N-O, -O, beans. And how do you prepare? Do you just eat them? Uh, you boil them a little bit? Or how do you, how do you uh, what's your preferred bean method of cooking? I tend to just make bean salad. I haven't gotten, or I just eat them. <laughs> I like marinated beans, cooked beans. I'm kind of like every once in a while I cook them. But um, I mean, you know, anything cooked with oil and garlic, of course, is delicious. Oh, yeah. I know what I you're saying wrong. about the, the scarlet runner beans. Years ago, someone grew those in our garden. And I thought they were like, I didn't like them at all. So I avoided pole beans for, you know, probably nine years. Exactly. And who knew? Actually, we planted four times, four kinds this year. Old Kentucky Wonder, Wonder Pole Bean, Blue Lake, and another one I don't know the name of. And they're actually quite delicious. So just avoid the Scarlet Runner Bean. <laughs> right, you, you, you could plant one just for show. It's very pretty. Yeah, it's pretty, but... But these are I'm, these are tasty, and this plant is massive. There's one of the pictures coming. We have that. It's probably an eight foot, you know, eight foot by four foot trellis, and I planted it over eight feet. The thing is completely covered. I mean, if you ever need a screen, some type of screen on a fence, this is it. That's true. And we. And we planted these after the peas, remember? So these didn't go in until end of June. Oh, wow. So, you know, they've just started producing because we had the, the regular bush beans. Right, you did two rounds. Yeah, you did, yeah, you did double yeah, rounds is, of beans. Yeah, this is round two. Now, how long did it take um, to germinate the seeds and to get a seedling that was uh, viable? Well, you know, like beans are a week or so. Okay, so if you, have plenty of, if you don't have moisture, nothing works, but we have right. enough, we had enough moisture. And they, you know, they started off, if I look back on all my pictures, I would know, but figure end of June, here it is end of September, and they started producing a few weeks ago. So, and we actually had some on, on the outside fence we put in earlier, and they produced quite a while ago, except we, the one thing we forgot about is the, the deer come across the outside of the fence. So they had a lot of those. Munch. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, perfect, perfect, uh, perfect level. Take a few bites and head on our way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the season, when you're done, do you leave the roots in the soil because um, of, the, of the nitrogen fixation? Do you, or do you uh, pull the whole thing out? Or do you compost the whole thing in the soil? Well, just 
actually these will come out and we produce so much compost. We can't compost at all. We started composting some of our stuff. But this is a big garden and the amount of, of foliage matter we have at the end. We have a friend with the DPW and they take it away. We're not on our own land, so we can't yeah. just like that. But the roots produce some, um, they have the rhizobacterium nods that produce um, ni nitrogen that's usable to the plants um, from the air. So if right. you leave the roots oh. in, you'll have you'll get the, the a nitrogen boost for the next planting or the, whatever yeah. you plant. Well, so, so, so leave it in and then pull it out at the beginning of well, next season. I always take the tops of the beans off because my beans at the end of the season when I grow grow them either have Mexican bean beetle or some kind of, fun, of leaf disease, and I don't want to you know I I pull them out, I bag them, and I throw them in in, in the garbage. Right. But I always leave the roots in because um of the nitrogen fixation because you you get that extra you know, boost, unless right. there's some disease in the roots that I, I, I had one year I had vir a virus disease and I, I just tore everything out and threw it away because it, it, a viral disease, you don't want to save anything. No, no. But in so the beginning, I, um, next spring, do you then pull out the um, remnants of the roots that you left or you just it, plant on top they'll of rot. They'll rot. They'll, they'll, by the next spring, they'll, they'll be basically rotted or there'll be very few remnants they should they'll be. They'll compost themselves. Yeah, okay. it'll just compost in the soil, yeah. Oh, great, thanks. I'll try that. That's a good idea. When when we start cleaning up the garden, I have this, we have a crew of people that are really gung ho at ripping things out. So sometimes <laughs> you have to you have to control them. And then we'll put peas in the spring there. So that's another. That's another know, one, yeah. And the, but the peas have to come out so the next crop can go in. I use but, peas as a as a green cover. A green manure a lot because um they come up quickly and and when you turn them in they just rot so quickly because right. they're so soft and and uh, you know but I, I yeah I, I tend to pull the, at the end of the season and, and tomatoes and peppers I I yank everything out because they're so oh, yeah. disease ridden right. they're, they're, right. they're just the garbage go. there's nothing left of them no. unfortunately we we got so many blights on those on the leaves that at the end of the season there's nothing but stalks right practically but all right next where's my next picture. This, this was the main zucchini bed. I mean, those zucchinis are long gone between the, the boars. One of the members did surgery and that didn't work. I have like two zucchini plants on the other end of the garden that are producing a little bit. Our group, they get excited. We'll have like a huge crop or something and then everyone's semi-tired of it. So it works <laughs> out. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, that's how it goes. Right, right. You get so nothing, one, then you get right. Like you know, now you're probably getting beat. You know, sick of beans. <laughs> yeah, now it's like oh, more beans. So this is I put these in. I don't know, two or three weeks ago. Remember we had really hot, and then it cooled off for a little while. Mm -hmm. So I put these in when it cooled off, and it was going to rain. Because I don't know about you, but planting um, greens or spring crops when the soil's too hot has never worked out for me. So this is some kale and some spinach coming up in the old, where the uh, zucchini was. Huh. And our cucumbers have blight. I ripped all them out and I've been looking, apparently the best thing to do about the blight is to solarize the soil, but it needs to be 90 degrees. Now it's not 90 degrees. So I left up the cucumber trellis and explained to everybody we're not covering, turning that over this year. And then in the spring, I'll cover it with the clear plastic and hopefully kill off what's ever in there. It should be killed by the time I put the, you know, seed the cucumber. So we'll see how that works. But I had blight in the other end of the garden from cucumbers last year, so. But I did get cucumbers. Did you ever plant cranberry beans? No. Huh? Are they a, a are they a green bean or a bean you a hard bean? Well, yeah, it'll turn hard. Um, so yeah, it's not a green bean. It's it's um, but you can eat them when they first um, grow. All right. As a you know before they turn hard. And I didn't try them this year. I tried them last year and didn't have any luck. 
but uh, they're really good. What's it called? It's a cranberry. Cranberry. Cranberry bean. Yeah. Sarah, huh? your cucumbers, um, do you plant them in the same bed every year? I'm sorry, what? Do you plant your cucumbers in the same bed every year? You don't rotate? Everything's rotated. The ones okay. last year were over at this end, this totally opposite end of the garden. Okay. Now, Sarah, what are your beds made out of? What kind of material did, did you um are your beds made out of? Is that wood? It's wood, yes. Yes. They look nice. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, we were given some funds and our fence that our members built 10 years ago with questionable construction skills. <laughs> <laughs> it's, seen its, it's seen its better days and a tree fell on it. So we had a man who um, we repurposed some of the materials and he built us a new fence. It's really nice. And we also redid our raised beds because they had been in for nine, eight or nine years. And this is this is modern modern wood the old pressurized wood you know became you weren't supposed to use it but they have wood now that is treated but whatever it's treated with is not full of arsenic so we use and they're um they're about what are they 32 long and four wide but they're built in sections so you have a i think they're eight feet by eight feet most of them and then we put um green wood chips down in the paths. Oh, you put green chips down? Fresh chips. Well, you know, I just as you said that I was always thinking you're not supposed to put them down because they'll leach nitrogen from the soil, but that really would be a good thing in between your garden beds. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. 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 We would yeah. never put them in the garden beds, but we've been putting them in the paths and really, right. I mean, the weeds still grow, Remember, we're, we're fortunate. Like, you have 10, 15 people show up and are willing to weed. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't look like this if I were doing it all on my own. But I don't know if you can see that trellis there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you see how big that bean, that whole bean thing is? <laughs> Those are the Romano beans you just showed us? Those are pole beans. There's a combination of them in there, but those are the pole beans. Wow. They're bionic. <laughs> Wow. And our massive sunflower took, was taken down during the wind. But I know. I was getting, Did all your sunflowers flop like during the not storm? Not all of them. But there's this one. It's hard to tell now. I call it the magic sunflower. It's, it's a volunteer that came back about five years ago. And we still get one. And when it came down, it had just started to bloom. And everybody wow. pulled in together. And we you know, put it back up and tied it up and everything now it's pretty much had it but you showed it last time it was beautiful yeah it's the biggest sunflower we have ever seen yeah. but this is this is the the side the tomatoes are all ratty now i mean they've they're, but, but they're producing like crazy they're just about done producing mm -hmm. the peppers are really starting to get ripe we have some really good poblanos uh we've got poblanos banana peppers a variety of hot peppers. I tried some new orange peppers this year. They're just getting orange. Mm -hmm. And there's a little one called a lipstick that's just starting to get going. But we have quite a lot of peppers. The parsley is on the, on the wane. The celery's still doing well. Basil's doing okay. And um, you know, for this time of year, there's still a decent amount of, of produce coming out of here. Sure, it looks, you know, looks wonderful. Oh, sorry, Chad. No, good. I'm just complimenting. You, Go ahead. You know what I wanted to ask you, Sarah? When um, you talked about finding pressurized wood that you um, didn't have arsenic in it, where did you find that? The, the guy who did this for us, but Lowe's, Home Depot, all those places. That, the evil wood, as we call it, that everyone got, you know, 
don't do this, never use this, whatever. Right, that, right. That's, that's been, been discontinued. It's no longer allowed. Oh, because I need to get some wood to hold up. I have some trellises that mm -hmm. um, over the winter are all with the ground freezing and then you yeah. know, expanding. They're beginning to get wobbly and I wanted to get some wood, but then I thought, well, it's pressurized and you know, then I'll be putting uh, arsenic in mm -hmm. the earth, but okay. And I can't remember the first, the first beds we had, I don't think the wood was treated at all because we put linseed oil on it. I remember planting, mm -hmm. painting it with linseed oil. And I can't remember if we painted these or not. The trellis is painted with linseed oil mm -hmm. and it has to be painted every few years. It's right. It's beginning right. to show its age. But no, if you, if you check around, there is wood that is okay for organic gardening. That's not oh, going to oh, rot no. in, in like one year. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. There's That's also good. places you can buy pre, um, pre-cut uh, uh, raised beds that use like a, a, a cedar wood or, and um, uh, I, I can send you a link to a place that I get it, but it's, it's kind of on the expensive side. Yeah. Um, but the good thing about it is it's a it's some kind of old fashioned joint. Um, I forget what it's called. It it a five year old could put it together, and I have the skills of a five year old when it comes to do it yourself stuff. So like I, if I can put it together, anyone can put it together. But and, the thing um, that's good about that it ends up paying for itself. Yes, I mean I, I honestly I I can't cut a straight piece of wood. I'm not good with the nail. I'm just you know so. I, I'll pay the money to have somebody do it for me so I, I don't have to do it. And it, 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 it takes literally five minutes to put together and the wood, um, it's made out of, I think, Vermont white cedar, um, but it's kind of pricey. So it depends, yeah. you know, if you have the skill or not. But, but it's, it's worth it because then they've done the work. It'll last yeah. a long time. For me, it's worth it. You know, yeah. if somebody else may say, say uh, you know, but it's all, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's well worth it, um, you know. Yeah, if you but, have that link, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. Um, I'll, I'll look it up and, and send it to you right now. Oh, so. thank you. Yeah. Cedar, is, yeah, cedar is definitely the best choice, for, but for a garden of this size, because remember, that's how many of these do we have? I forget how many of these beds we have, but for a garden our size to do cedar was not, you know. Yeah, it's expensive. It budget. would cost you a lot of money. Yeah, right. yeah I, I understand, because, you know, just one, one four by eight is $200. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. can you you right. can imagine no, we can't. that's not yeah. hard. Yeah, I forgot to tell you our tomatillo is finally ripened. I was about to ask you. Yay! Yes, yes. yes. Do you have pictures of those. I did forgot to take a picture of them. I'll do one for. I'll get a picture of them. I didn't. I had never tried Next those, time. and I wanted to. Yeah. Yes, we, we we got a, we got a lot in our garden. I am not. I made salsa verde. Very tasty. I put them in my bean salad too. Everything goes in bean salad. <laughs> <laughs> there are right, Michelle, Michelle had a few questions. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have another question for Sarah before I come to my oh. many other questions. So, Sarah, when you said you solarized the soil where you had the blight in your cucumber bed, my garden space is at a premium. I had blight. I pulled all the plants out, and I ended up putting leak seedlings in there. Am I yeah. going to run an issue? We haven't, we haven't solarized yet. This is the spring project. By the time I pulled the plants out, we had all that 90 degree heat. Mm -hmm. So by the time I figured this out, it went and cooled off. Right. Wouldn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the solarizing, is, the thing is, other things do fine. I mean, it's just the, the, the cucumbers, this disease showed up about last year. And at first I thought it was just airborne, but now it may also be you know, in the soil. But other crops I plant in the bed are fine. This is something specific to, it's a specific cucumber disease. And whether it's airborne or soil borne, I am not 100%, but it's got my cucumbers. So yeah, you can plant, leaks in there they're not gonna okay okay good yeah but we definitely need to hear more about the solarizing because i think that that's going to be useful chad what do you think when we talk about prepping for next year uh, uh, definitely yeah 
Mm -hmm. All right, now we're on to Michelle had a bunch of excellent questions. Yeah. Michelle, uh, take it away. Okay, the, the picture is a little pulled wider than yeah, you would sorry. see. Than you <laughs> that, would see so these really do look enormous. Speaking about <laughs> yes. bionic vegetables. My, yeah, it looks like a 70s, uh, I don't know what I did there. <laughs> But they're probably they're probably like four or five inches big okra, and probably about two inches wide. Is what? that no? I've never grown okra. Is this too large? Is it going to be nasty? Should I just give up on it? <laughs> I don't know how I missed harvesting them, but they're giant. Anyway, My answer to everything is harvest one and try it. <laughs> I'm scared. I was so <laughs> okay. and they say, what is this? I said, well, just take a piece off and eat it. And they go, what? I mean, does it look like it's bolted or like on crazy or flat, you know, like uh, the whole plant? No, no, it's producing more flowers. It's taller than I am. It's wow. really uh, no, I think it's, I think it's, it should be fine. I mean, I don't think there's something that, you know, I mean, it's not like big, like, you know, seven feet long. So I, I think. Right. You should yeah, be all right, I'm and you're right. Like you know, you, you can try a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okra could be you know this big, definitely. Okay, all right. I'll let you and, know. And, and if we if we don't see you for next uh, time, we know it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the right decision. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is my uh, and I don't know why I I didn't remember what we discussed in one of the previous very exciting episodes of our Zoom Garden plot, but I have this delicious. <laughs> cherry tomato called chocolate sprinkle. It is a hybrid. Um, I want to save the seeds and plant them. And my question is, if I plant them, am I gonna get more chocolate sprinkles or am I gonna get cherries with parent traits? You're gonna get cherries with parent traits. You, the hybrids are uh, two different types bred together. You, they don't breed true to the parents. That's open pollinated seeds. So you could try, you, you'll get something whether it's good or not, it's up to Mother Nature how the how the DNA combined. But you're not going to get what uh, you're not going to get exactly what right. what you That's thought you were going to get. That's what I thought. Yeah. And then I don't have so much space that I can devote to experimenting because my fiance Rick was saying, "Let's plant it and then see what we get. And if we happen to get a chocolate cherry sprinkle, we can plant." You might get something again. better. I mean, you might get something. You might get, but the chances are probably are, are you know are probably not that good. But um. Yeah. If you if you're looking to grow safe seed, look for open pollinated or, right. or heirloom. Those are the ones that that, that breed true. Like aroma right. that's open seeded. You know, if you save the seed, you're going to get aroma. It's going to be just like the one that you planted. Um, if you know, if you look, if you get a big girl or I, the new one, like a bodacious that's from Burpee, it's a, it's just came out. It's a hybrid. You're not going to get a bodacious the mm -hmm. next year. You're going to get something probably probably way inferior. It's gonna it's yeah. gonna lean towards one parent, and sometimes it's the combination of the parents. You could have two inferior plants when they combine them; it makes something really special. Mm -hmm. So, um, All right. thank you. That that was a good answer. Yeah, I know. I, I'm really trying to study the seed thing. I I, so, I just bought a book on it. It's very confusing. <laughs> I, I can't get it down in my head. And, and then, how do you stop things from cross pollinating? Like how? Like how? Oh, would they you... they they you know they cut the flower. There's a whole That's technique. It's a whole they... procedure. It's way too much work. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, so like, yeah. Just buy a packet of seeds. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> or, or just buy the plant. I buy the plant. I can't even grow. The, I don't have time to grow the seeds. Um, I get burpees, and I, I never have a failure with them. And that's one time they did because I plant. They sent them too early, and I planted them too early. They actually, um, and I called. I complained. I said you sent it way too early, and we had a frost. They actually reimbursed me for not just the plants, but my whole order. Mm -hmm. um, oh, nice. It, which it be, they, they say because it was la it was last year and they said we can't replace the plants because you know there was a pandemic everyone everyone ordered there's no plants left so we'll just um we'll just give you all your money back on everything and i'm like you don't have to and they're like no no we'll do it so um like, okay. i go to them and, and I, I i never have bad luck with them even if the plants look scrawny or you know you put them in the soil you nurture them and within a few weeks they're outpacing what somebody bought um no, yeah i hear I, i'm the same yeah i hear what you guys make sense but then i was you know in my grow local green with lake thing i was thinking of you know trying to start a seed library in the library and then so i, so I was doing some research and then you know i definitely need someone who understands the stuff better than i do because it's like right like you said hybrid open pollinated then right 
then the, the part I just couldn't figure out is how to make sure it doesn't cross pollinate. And I was like, how, how, how would I have to come up with like giant yeah, tents? They, and that doesn't even think? include nowadays where they do the gene splicing. That's a whole other, you know. But I like the, I like the, I wish someone like you would come over and we should have seed libraries everywhere that we could have these great native should, local seeds. We should, we should save our seeds and, and, and swap them, and, you know, if we, yeah. if we know. I mean, yeah, know. Nicole's usually pretty good. And the one, he's usually at these meetings. She's very good with seeds. Nicole. I'm here. Oh, yeah. oh, were you here the whole time? No. Yeah, I was, I was on silent. Autumn was running around. He just went oh, to the shower. Oh, yes, Nicole does a seed swap, right? Hope you're going to do one uh, next spring, I maybe? I would like to. May maybe. Um, I mean, it's not bad to maybe even do one for in the fall. But yeah, they're absolutely right. In trying to save and preserve so it doesn't cross-pollinate, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, like, as soon as the flower mind. develops, you need to put... um. Like you ever see those little jewelry bags that are, you know, mm -hmm. the ties on other oh, side, yeah. you put it around the flower, oh. you keep you it cut closed, the flower and then you have to hand pollinate. Cut the, cut the stamens out so there's no pollen. And oh my God, have no the way. Over, <laughs> the pistol <laughs> no there, way. and then you got to get a, get, go to the plant and get the pollen, pollen from the plant. And, and it's just a procedure. And, and uh, you know, there's a whole art behind it or, or mm -hmm. a study behind it. So it's that you can do it. I mean, but, um, you know, it's a skill. No, it is. No, some people, uh, I, like I went uh, a few years ago, somewhere in Philadelphia, they have just this, uh, a whole garden that just, they, they, let, they let everything go to seed. This is all they do is make seeds. So oh. it, was, it was such a crazy garden because everything was looked like it was chaotic, but that's how, that's what they wanted. You know, they don't harvest it and they let it go to seed. But that, that was their passion. They knew what they were doing. And But uh, yes, that's, like you said, I, I can't be tying right. things up with uh, jewelry bags and stuff. There's another thing I think you have to consider. Like I've started, I let, I let in certain greens go to seed. I started it because the flowers attracted pollinators, but like the arugula, mm. some of the chards, some, some of these things they let go to seed, I've saved them and then I replant them and they've done fine. But my rule of thumb is something that grows quickly, greens that you have 30, 35 days to harvest, fine, experiment with it. Tomatoes and peppers, how long does it take to grow a tomato and pepper plant around here? All summer. Yeah. <laughs> Do I want to take a chance on using my garden space for an experiment that may or may not work? Right, it goes bad, yeah. I mean, if I want to try one plant, but I'm not going to put, you know, my whole tomato or pepper crop into the idea of saving a seed and then finding out in August they're horrible. Especially <laughs> since I have 30 people waiting for tomatoes. So we can have look, at, look at that part of it too. The beauty of that, Sarah, though, I find, because I have saved some tomato seeds in the past and mm -hmm. cucumbers as well, yeah. all you really need to do is just pick like your one beautiful piece of fruit and just scoop out the seeds from that one piece. You still get to eat the fruit and harvest it. And that one fruit is giving you enough seeds, more than enough to share with other people. You know, like I wouldn't dedicate a whole plant, a whole plant. I mean, if I was selling seeds for a living, maybe, but you know. That's the way I've looked at it, but I get what you're saying. No, no, no I, I, mean, think, I, I think I think Sarah's saying that she, sure. she's afraid that of all the seeds you scoop out next year would not come out. True. Oh, yeah. put for next year. Yeah, well, yeah I, mean, I have had like a Franken variety of things <laughs> from that, but it had to be because it was a hybrid and it wasn't an heirloom. That's mm -hmm. what I mean, because mostly I'm using hybrid tomatoes. I mean, so, it could turn out that you have something better. But right. I mean, right. the chances, you, you know, it's like a crapshoot, like, you know. Right. That's what I mean. It's it's the time committed to those particular plants. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Sarah's, I running, I Sarah's running Sarah's running community in garden. California, fine. Yeah. But, right. you know, yeah. no, you're, you're, running, you're, you're running a community garden. You can't tell everyone, oh, sorry, guys. All it's the tomatoes are horrible. Sorry this oh, year. Yeah. You know. And, and tomatoes are so much here. work. There's so much work, you know, to get yeah. it, to, to grow the plant and the space and everything. All right, one last question from uh, Michelle. Yeah, so you can see that I'm on the seed saving uh, <laughs> kick here. And I'm, I'm in this book that we're going to talk about, hopefully, in the next session, Chad. Can you remember what it's called? Oh, uh, Nature's Next Best Hope, I think it's called. Doug, Doug Talame, I can't remember. Yeah. I think it's Nature's Next Best Hope or something like that. Um, 
he promotes a lot of ideas like planting for pollinators, not just to pollinate our vegetable gardens, but he's saying that if pollinators don't pollinate plants, period, we're going to run out of oxygen. Yeah, nature's best hope. Nature's best hope. So um, I've decided to be a little bit more careful in my garden and I downloaded the picture this app and I'm going around and snapping pictures of all the things that I don't know what they are. And I found that my garden is overrun with invasive plants. Mm. And this is, when I say garden, I'm using it in the loose British way. So okay. my, 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 land, my property, right. not my hedge garden. So yeah, that's why you're weeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have a lot of weeds and not all, I mean, some of it's attractive, but they're apparently very invasive. They're non-natives. And at this point in the year, they've all gone to seed. So I am carefully putting them in a wheelbarrow. And now I've got this massive wheelbarrow. My compost is not hot enough to cook these seeds. Do I let it dry and put it on my fire pit? What do I do with these seeds? I'm too scared to put them in the woods. Are they mixed it's in with the waste, compost or are they it's separated? It's waste management. Not yet. It's in a big um, wheelbarrow and I just am sitting on it and I don't know what to do. But I guess Michelle's asking what to do. You know, do I you compost them or, or, they, or do I just throw them in the garbage or do I? You put you know, it in a big plastic bag and you put it in a thing that says waste management on it and take it out to the curb. Yeah, that okay. would probably be the safest thing. I mean, Just unless like a diseased plant, I send yes. those out. Yeah, exactly. Just get rid of it. Yeah, get rid of it. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you don't, if you if you really don't want it, then that's the best way to get rid of it. Because it, you you know, you could sit there and do all these things with your compost. You can spread it out, let it grow a little, kill the plants that come out of it. But it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be such a, a pain. I think Sarah's right. Just put it in a bag, uh, tie it up, throw it in the garbage, and and that's it. They okay. won't grow anywhere. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I studied permaculture. a lot of volume, though. Michelle, you know, I studied, you know, I, I read a lot of permaculture stuff. This is the biggest argument in, in the permaculture circles of what's really? native. What, is that, what does that even mean to be, you know, do you just focus on native? How do you define native? You know, how many plants are really native to this area? So you know, Doug Tallamy has a really good explanation of that in his book, Chad, did you read it? I, I think I did get it a little while ago. And yeah, I agree with what he's saying, but then I still, you know, go back. <laughs> because some of the plants that are, you know, the, the, when you, you, I mean, there is an argument. I mean, how far back do you go to, for it to be native? Right. The, the Mayflower? Oh, I mean, oh, right. Know, Almost nothing we eat here is really native. Yeah, apples what, are not eat, native. Uh, yeah, yeah. Apple, yeah, so many things that are not native. So it, what, what's the cutoff? So, so what, 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 what does she say? The Wildlife Federation has a list of plants that are wildlife friendly. Basically, he's talking about the ones that he calls carrying capacity. So plants that have the greatest carrying capacity in terms of supporting um, mm -hmm. diversity. Mm -hmm. And he lists those. And then he talks about these quote unquote non-natives as having a carrying capacity of two, for example. So yes, you know, pollinators might stop by like the butterfly bush, for example, but Leia, um, it's filled with butterflies, but it has no carrying capacity in terms of allowing um, those pollinators to pupate um, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't take the species full circle. It just provides calories for them, which is not a dreadful thing, but it, it it's taking up space of something that could allow for the full life cycle full of the animal. But I don't want to get too far ahead because I know yeah. we're going to talk about this next right, time. We'll, we'll my right issue then. is just, you know, I have this, I have masses of, I guess, biomass and I'm trying to run, you know, I, I'm trying to go towards zero waste. So I can, I have a really hard time taking this biomass, putting it in the plastic bag and out at the curb. So there are different parts of me fighting with myself and I'm just kind of can stuck you burn looking it? at this massive stuff. Uh, are you allowed to burn in your town? Because a lot of yes. towns, then burn it. Burn, burn the it. Burn, put, okay. burn it, burn it. And then actually you can take, burn it thoroughly. Don't use an accelerator. Okay. And don't use like gasoline or kerosene or lighter fluid, just burn it without that. And then once you're done burning it, collect the ashes and spread them back into your compost or your garden. Mark, is that biochar? It's not biochar, but it's, it'll, 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 it'll add pot, potash to your garden. Okay. And, you could, and you can make some s'mores while you're burning it so that it'll be multifunctional. <laughs> Biochar is a little differently. Bart, biochar is, I think, where they, it's almost like roasted, where it becomes, um, like a charcoal and then that charcoal helps to absorb it it, it, it there's a lot of things it does it, um but it, but biochar is a, a a good thing in your garden um but you, yeah just 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 burn it into ash and then once it's ash 
um, you know, use it uh, sparingly, but you can scatter it in your garden. Um, just be careful though, because you don't, you don't want to overload it with potassium because, yeah. uh, you know, basically ash has a lot of pot, potash in it and potash is made up of potassium and you can overload it. And you don't want too much of an imbalance between the NP and Ks. Yeah, but um, that can go back in the compost, right, Mark? Yeah, that's, I, yeah I, that's I would best. just, I, I would just not, I would just be, I, I would read up on it and make sure you're not, don't put too much, you know, okay. don't, don't just, just don't a ton and overwhelm it kind of thing. Um, you know, but you can always store it. You can get a, get a five gallon bucket at Lowe's and just store the ash. I mean, when you're talking about a large biomass, it burns down to a small amount. Yeah. Um, you know, so you're not, you, you might have bales and bales of it, but by the time you're done burning it, you probably have two or three, five bucket containers. And yeah. then you can just, um, five gallon containers, and then you can just use it, you know, whenever it's, it doesn't go bad. Right. Um, right. I, I, think that, I think that's the best solution right there. I think there's, so too. Thank you. There's another method I've used because I have a, I only have a third of an acre, but a part of it was just natural gone to weeds when I moved here 20 years ago. And these things still grow. So I have massive amounts of this stuff. I've tried everything. I chop it up with the mower and then I bag it. But I've also taken it, kind of chopped it and put it into, you can put it into paper bags and I put it in black plastic bags and I took those and put them along my fence line where it's trying to kill other weeds. Mm. So those bags suppress the weeds there and the weeds inside the bags decompose. Oh, that's really clever. Wow, you got too many layers going on there. I'm then kind of, massive of, point amounts of, of non-native stuff is like an endless project at my house. Another yeah. thing you could do, Michelle, is what I do is when I like in the garden when I get uh, when I was when I first got the plots and there was a ton of weeds, I dug a huge hole in the middle of the plot and I took all the weeds, the crabgrass, all these weeds, and I dug them, stuck them in the bottom of the pit and ca covered it with like two feet of soil. There's no way it's going to grow yeah, out of that. Out. And yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll rot. It'll, it'll the, the seeds will rot. Everything will eventually rot because it's so far deep. It won't be disturbed, and you're adding a lot of um, organic matter to the soil. So you could do that too if you if you know. But it, it you got just got to bury it really really deep. I mean that's another solution too. That's wonderful. Thank you. And Nicole, you. Nicole just added the, something useful to the chat. Oh, the zero waste. Yeah. The zero, zero waste store. But I was going to say, what about chickens? No. Oh yeah, chickens. I don't have any, but yeah. Not a bad idea. I let, and they make you know gold for the for the garden with you know with their poop. If you have a friend, yeah, if you have a friend right. who has a chicken, um, any yeah, they they eat, they eat everything. They're like little. Come and invite them eggs. over for a, a lunch date with the chicken. And then, then they'll owe you eggs too. They'll have to give you eggs. That's right. Yeah, that's It'll a great be... idea. Thanks, guys. I have chickens. You can come over with stuff. The chickens will eat them, and I most certainly will give you eggs. <laughs> it's you a go. barter system. We'll go back to the barter system. Oh, I like the gift system better. I love barter. The gift system. No, even barter. Just gift. All right. Well, thank you. This is excellent. Uh, we have a few announcements. The next plot will be on uh, Monday, September 27th at 7.30. And then I guess we'll, we'll figure out our schedule. We've been discussing, you know, moving forward into the fall and winter. You know, if we're going to do twice a month, once a month, and maybe take a few months off. Um. Every Wednesday for a few more weeks at uh, 13 Poplar Street in Greenwood Lake. Again, if you have all those, a uh, lot of produce that you're getting sick of, as Sarah says, if you, you know, want to bring over a bag full of beans, you could either donate them or hopefully exchange with someone else. And then I, we bring them to the um, senior center and the food, uh, food, food pantry in Greenwood Lake because I don't like to waste anything. And, uh, you know, it's a really nice place, way to meet your neighbors as well. Um, this is a really nice thing that's gonna happen very shortly. We gotta sign up by the 15th, uh, training and public tree management. Um, I probably should have, I was gonna send this as an attachment and I might need that. Uh, the Dutchess County is a comprehensive training program. I believe it's gonna be uh, via Zoom. Mm. So if you want to take down that information, I'll leave it up for a little bit. I, 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 you need a you need a certificate in a pesticide application in order to take this, though. Oh, you do? Yeah, it says that somewhere on that flyer. I was 
very interesting. Oh, and I, saw I guess I should that. read it more. I should read it more carefully. <laughs> I don't have that cert certification. And it's yeah, also not many during the day. <laughs> right. Yeah. The hours are uh, definitely not ideal. No. Wait, trees are uh, far as but in recent years, of course, I don't know. What is it? If you uh, comprehend intellectual training, Cornell tree. No, I, I think I don't think we need to have that. Do you see that here? Yeah, sort of on the bold left column, NYSDC pesticide certification. Then I went to the website and it said it there. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, I guess they uh, really made that hard to, hard to notice. <laughs> There's no way of getting around that. You have to, you have to oh, have I that. I don't know. Maybe. You, you could try contacting them. Uh, for further information, it says uh, contact St Stephanie Radin at S-R-A-D-I-N at cornell.edu. Well, it looks like a wonderful program. Yeah, because I, mm -hmm. I would find that strange that you need a pesticide well, certification first. It is first. the public tree, so I imagine that's where that requirement came in. Even though I think I did, I did take a course in Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I might have something. But I it can't says, do this anyway. It says community volunteers, though. I, uh, usually, community volunteers and master gardeners don't have pesticide licenses. That's true. True. Yeah. That, that's you know. That's yeah, we'll something see, that's, but, yeah. If, you, that, if you work in the industry, then um, I, I can't see a community volunteer having a pest. There's no yeah. point in having it. Right. Yeah. That would be that, that would be that would be unusual. Yeah. Um, any other announcements? Anyone know of any uh, workshops, classes, any last minute questions before we wrap it up? We did go a bit over. I, I have one quick question. Um, do, would, do you guys, uh, have you have you guys, or um, do you guys talk about like uh, putting in cover crops for the winter or how do, how do you manage your gardens in the winter? Um, well, you know what, I, I would hold off on that one. I think I was thinking that maybe, maybe our next session, that, that, yeah, that that's yeah. a whole, I was thinking that very much. Like I, I was gonna, I really want to know how we, how is everyone gonna end their season? Mulching, cover crop. Like how, how's, how is every, what's everyone's yeah, recommendation? Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even want to start that because that's a okay. great topic. I would but I, I would say that's that. something maybe for next session. And really, right. that is something I'm very curious because everyone seems to have a different strategy or philosophy, and I would really like that. I would to like, be focused. yeah. I have my own, but I love I love to hear other people's strategies and see how they do it. And all right, so that's it, Michelle. You're doing next one, right, Michelle? Remember I'm that. I'm doing the next one. So, um, Mark, uh, send me your questions if it's you know if it's more substantial right. than what you just on mentioned. On the 27th, we're going to just everyone bring pictures or whatever you do if you call it, if you cover it with cover crop or mulch it or whatever, you know whatever you guys do to, to your garden. And like Mark said, the great idea about leaving the beans in the ground. You know, any type of strategies you have would be great. Or if you continue to plant like me, <laughs> or like yeah, or like Bill, you know, Bill, who has you know, who continues just to go nonstop. But yeah. as it seems to me, like Sarah and I look like we're like wrapping it up. <laughs> we need a break. <laughs> Winter. All right. Did Thank can you guys I ask so one much. quick question? Oh yes, yes. I came in like ten minutes late. Was there talk about a book club or something? Because I thought Michelle just said, and you guys were talking about a book. Are we oh. reading something together? Oh, 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 Chad. <laughs> yes, we should probably just mention that then again. Um, oh, sorry. So Sustainable oh, Warwick is reading, uh, Sustainable Warwick has a book club that meets during the day. I can never attend it, but one of the books that they're reading right now is- Nature's Best up. Hope. Thank you, by Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallam I mess that up all the time. <laughs> Doug Tallamy. It's a fantastic book. I just finished reading it. I had- literally light bulb moments all over the place he yeah, gives it's, it's, it's right good. at the end of the book he gives 10 great ways to make your garden more sustainable more wildlife friendly something that everybody can do those kind of things um, yeah so, so so there is right sustainable work does have a book club and but i think uh, we mentioned we might even discuss it in you know october november if we, if we want to have a session yeah. of, of the zoom garden plot you know during the off season we might That's do that as well. That's a great idea. I oh, love that. Everybody <laughs> wants to see if you can get your hands on that book. It really is phenomenal. And okay. then we can certainly discuss it. All right. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate right. it. Thanks. Great Thanks for Thanks the invitation. So no, always. Thank everyone. Spread Thanks, the word. everybody. Have Thank a great night. Bye-bye. Two weeks or around town. <laughs>